Thank you. So, as you said, my name is Michael, and I was invited here today to talk about Shadowrun. Um, I'll tell you a story about our development, and I focus uh, especially on the community side of things, because I think you already heard a lot of development talks today. Um, so, we we'll start about me. Um, I was uh, working three, more than three years at Cliffhanger Productions. We were a Viennese company, and um, we were focused on online strategic turn-based games. I say I was a game designer at this company because we hit insolvency uh, one month ago. So we dispersed, but we're currently reforming a small team, so let's see what, what's happening there. But I'm also currently looking, looking for opportunities. Uh, could you take the next slide? Because, well, that was the slide. <laughs> okay, um, then let's start with um, these were the games um, Cliffhanger Productions uh, were doing. The first wing was called uh, Check, Check the Lines Online. It was, um, an on, an, uh, it was playable uh, in the browser, and we also ported it to, to the PC. Um, it's like the standard Check the Lines uh, gameplay. You hire your mercs, you go on terrorist missions, and you try to improve your, your um, company and get better mercenaries. Um, Arena Clash of Champions was uh, I think it was one of the coolest product, uh, products uh, of our company. It is like if you take League of Legends and you take chess and you merge them together, then, it's that, then Arena comes out. It's playable on iOS, on Steam, and on Android. And uh, it's like chess with, um, but each piece has different abilities. And you, you have these cool ships, and you're the captain of the ship. You, you fly onto the, um, the piece uh, of, of the board, and then you try to destroy the enemy ship. So if you have uh, an iPad, uh, try it out. And the game I'm talking the most today um, is called Shadowrun Chronicles. Um, for the one of you who don't know it, we, it was called Shadowrun Online until half a year ago. Then we changed the name from Shadowrun Online to Shadowrun Chronicles to actually reflect that we are not an MMORPG because that was the popular opinion and uh, that's why we had to do the name change. Um, I don't explain Shadowrun Chronicles since I'll talk uh, about it uh, later. Um, so about the topics for today, uh, first I explain Shadowrun. I explain the license, I explain the players behind them, I explain how we, we, how we found out the wishes and how we tackled these wishes to actually make a successful Shadowrun game, uh, which the players um, then like. Um, then I'll talk about our Kickstarter journey. Um, I don't talk about the standard do's and don'ts because every one of you who wants to do a Kickstarter can just Google them. Um, I won't bore you with these, but I will tell you about the do's and don'ts we experienced in our campaign. And there are like really small things, but there are a lot of small things. And if you do them, uh, they can really uh, be a pain to ask. So um, I hope this will be quite interesting for you. And then I'll talk about early access. Um, early access uh, is a cool thing, like you already uh, heard. But um, it also has some, some um, risks, and I, I will uh, enlighten you with both sides uh, of early access, which, again, we experienced. Um, OK, then let's, then let's start with Shadowrun. Um, so for you who don't know Shadowrun, Shadowrun is a pen and paper game. It was uh, invented by Jordan Weissman in 1989. And it's uh, like a dark cyberpunk game it's like they, uh, the people from 1989, how they imagined the world would be in 2070. So there's a lot of hackers, and you can imagine it a bit like Blade Runner. And on the other side, you have Lord of the Rings, like with elves, magic, and dwarves. And you just take these two worlds and merge them together, and then, then you have Shadowrun. So you, ha you have these dwarf, dwarf uh, hackers, you have these elven mages, and they're doing all kind of things together. Um, in the Shadowrun universe, there are like big corporations. Um, there, there are no states anymore. There are only corporations, and the law of the corporation is like, um, well, the law of the corporation is the law of the world. Um, and the players in Shadowrun are actually called Shadowrunners. And the Shadowrunners are doing the dirty work for the corporations. So they are like criminals, but not like, like standard criminals. They are like better equipped, better trained criminals. And it's the, the missions from, for, for Shadowrunners are mostly about blackmailing, about hacking into a server room and grab some data, about extracting people from 
somewhere. And it's also, um, Sharon is also uh, big about intrigue. So um, in, in the Sharon Payne paper, it's often that uh, your quest giver, so to say, betrays you and um, sends you a suicide mission, for example, just to, so he doesn't need to pay you. Um, so this is also a big part of Shadowrun. And myself, um, I'm in the Shadowrun community for more than six years. I, I played a lot. Um, my chef, Jan Wagner, was in the Shadowrun community, I think, more than 12 years. Um, I'm, I was more in the German market. He was more in the, in the English-speaking market. So we actually knew the community. So we hadn't to do the full research. We actually, since we played it ourselves, we, we had a kind of a feeling what the players would like, what they don't like. Um, but to be sure, um, we, we tried to engage with the community. And what we did, for example, was we, we traveled to conventions. That's a thing I can really recommend to all, uh, every one of you. If you have the chance to go to, to like Gen Con, Gamescom or so, um, go there, talk to, 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 to the players. Um, because you will uh, learn so much things you, you, you never would have guessed that um, they actually like. And we, we, um, we, talk, we looked at the Shadowrun games, which were created until now. There were two major Shadowrun games. One was for the Super Nintendo. It was in 1993, and it was a great game. Everyone liked it, so we, we, we looked at the game. What, what did they do right? Then we, we checked out uh, Microsoft did also a Shadowrun game, um, I think, around 2000. And this Shadowrun game totally flopped, because, especially because the pen and paper uh, players are like, there are hardcore role players, and making a shooter for hardcore role player players, well, it was not probably the best decision from Microsoft, so this game flopped. Um, and we also looked at the reviews from these games and tried to extract what the community really expects from a Shadowrun game. And when we, when we looked at this, um, at at this uh, wishes from the community, we could extract three wishes. The one was um, they wanted to have another Super Nintendo game. Um, the game from, for the Super Nintendo was like their, the messiah uh, of, of games. And it was like 20 years, no, not 20 years, 15 years since this game was actually out. So um, they wanted to have this, this, this feeling back. And um, so this was one big wish. Um, the other two wishes, and these were the wishes we focus on, um, these wishes were um, that they can play Shadowrun together and that they have an impact on the world with their character. Playing Shadowrun together, um, you have to understand, um, I don't know how, how many of you know what pen and paper is, but pen and paper is like you, you sit together on a table and there, there are like three to four players and there's one game master and the players have created characters according to the rule set of the pen and paper and they have like their, their attributes and their, their um, well, abilities of the characters printed out on a paper in, uh, in front of them. And then there's a, a game master who actually serves as, well, the, how do you say it, the, um, the link to the, to the imaginary world. And the players then act in this imaginary world and the game master then tells them the outcome of the actions and how the world reacts to the players. Um, so, Every, not every Shadowrun player, but if you play Shadowrun, you most likely have a group of people you playing Shadowrun together like every two weeks. You, you meet like Saturday evening and you play around the Shadowrun until midnight. And that's what, so when people wanted to play a Shadowrun game, they didn't only want to play it for themselves, they also wanted to play with the group. They wanted to have like, okay, every Saturday we play Shadowrun together, but what do we at Wednesday evening? We can't go together because probably our wives will kill us, for example, because we're only playing Shadowrun. So let's maybe, can we, can we just play a PC game to, together, like a multiplayer game? That would be great if something like that exists. And so we thought, okay, how can we actually grant them that wish? What, what do we have to do to, to realize that? And we said, okay, it's obviously we can't do an MMORPG. It would be the obvious choice, like you have giving the players this big world and, uh, but, you know, we were 25 people at the time, and an MMORPG for 25 people is pretty much out of scope. So we thought, okay, how could we reduce it to, to make this wish still come true? And um, then we, we watched at Guild Wars, we watched Guild Wars 1, and then, um, I'm also not sure if you know it, but Guild Wars 1 had like this, this, the cities, and in the cities, yeah, you were able to meet other players, you were able to chat with them, you could, could show off your gear and your, your 
whatever you had on your character, your hair color and things like that. And as soon as you went out of the city, you were like in an instance. And in an instance, only people in your party uh, accompanied you. And we thought, okay, that, that's what we actually could do. So in Shadowrun, we, we also had these, these cities, these hubs in the cities where players can show off all their, their stuff. And as soon as they join a mission, then they're only with their players. And um, since Clifford Productions um, was really into this uh, online turn-based strategy games. We said, okay, let's do an online turn-based strategy games for Shadowrun. It also made sense for the community because they were like these tacticians. Um, so as soon as they join a mission, they are like in a four-player turn-based game. And to actually speed it up, we, we made like not a boring um, co-op turn-based, like player one waits for pl uh, player two waits for player one, player three waits for player two. We made like a co-op where every player can move simultaneously and only when something speci special happens, like a player shoots a bad guy, then the game freezes for a second, and then everyone can um, start playing again. Um, the second wish was a bit harder, because having an impact on the world with your own character is hard to do, again, for 25 uh, men team. Uh, I'm actually not sure how many games out there actually have such a system. So it was, again, for us out of scope to do or imagine something like that. And there were also, there's also a sub-point in there because we thought, okay, how could you have an impact on the world with a character if you just have like a generic character everyone could have? Uh, in the pen and paper, again, in Shadowrun, every, every player has this unique character. For every session, uh, for every new group, he, he makes this crazy new character. Only he possesses, probably on the, on the whole world, this character is unique. And um, so we thought, okay, before he can have, leave an impact on the world, he has to create this unique character. And so we put a lot of, of time into customization and cloughing items so players can really express their, their, their character in unique ways. And also an important thing, which we did to realize the point, was um, that in Shadowrun uh, Chronicles, um, like, if you play a mage, you don't have to wear long robes uh, because um, we have two different items. One gives you the attributes and the stats, and the other one is just for, for your visual appearance. So you actually can play a biker dwarf uh, mage, um, and you're not limited to like, the standard mage clothing. Since you now have this unique character in our game, you can, uh, can play it and you can show it off. Um, how do we want to realize the, the impact on the world? And we looked at the Telltale games. They always did like, um, if you play the first um, um, episode of Walking Dead, you were left with the choice if you kill Kelly or if you, uh, if you kill Duck. Um, I, I mean, the choice was if you want to save Kelly or if you want to save Duck, but in the end, it's the same, so. Um, <laughs> um, and, you, and after the episode, they say like, okay, 60% of the players have, well, saved Kelly but only 40% safe duck. And so we said, okay, can, can we adapt it for, for Shadowrun? And um, we, in the end, uh, since we were, uh, we were running out of budget, uh, budget we only impl implemented one choice um, for Shadowrun Chronicles, which is really bad, but the goal was to have more of these. And in Shadowrun Chronicles, the choice is like, you meet a certain character, and at the end, or somewhere in the game, you can decide if this character is going to live, or if it's not, uh, if, if, if the character does not live on. And we went to Catalyst, we're actually the publishers of the pen and paper, and we asked them, hey, can we do some kind of cooperation? Um, because we want to really have players have an impact on, on, on the world. And they said, yeah, cool, let, let's do that. And so depending if like 60% of the players save these characters in Shadowrun Chronicles, then it will, the character will live on in the pen and paper. So people can actually play our game and have an impact on their pen and paper groups. So um, the new adventures with these characters will be written. If, if like 60% of the characters kill the character off, the character won't appear in the game anymore. And um, the landscape of the game will change. So this is how we imagined, could we do like this impact on the world with the character? Um, OK. Um, after we thought, okay, now we know how we want to do our game, how can we finance it? Because, uh, well, publisher, investor, it's all... <clears throat> and at that time, it was three years ago, um, Kickstarter was starting to boom. It, it was, we were like on the, one of the first projects we were actually going big on Kickstarter. It was the time when Star, Star Citizen started to raise enormous amounts of money. And so we thought, okay, yeah, maybe we can do our game on Kickstarter too. And before I start with the do's and don'ts for, for Kickstarter, I just want to tell our Kickstarter story because it's a really crazy story. Um, 
we, we, we said, okay, we know if we do our game on Kickstarter, the community will probably uh, react positively to it because we really tried to nail down the wishes. And so we, we, we set up everything. We just had to press the launch button on Kickstarter, and we called Jordan Weisman. And, and Jordan Weisman is the inventor of Shadowrun, and we said, hey, cool, dude, could you, could you give us an endorsement for Kickstarter? Because if you say that we are cool, then um, we probably will have an even more easier time on Kickstarter. And he said, yeah, that's, well, that's tricky because I just wanted to launch my own campaign. And it was like, okay, shit. Because we, um, two, two Shadowrun projects at the same time on Kickstarter, and especially if the other Kickstarter project is from the inventor of, of Shadowrun, we, we, problem, we probably won't gonna make it. So we said, okay, Jordan, um, shit happens. Okay, you go first. And then Jordan, uh, then Jordan Weissman uh, raised 1 million and 800,000 euros in Kickstarter because he made the first Shadowrun game since a decade. And he, he actually realized the first wish of the community. He made like the new Super Nintendo game. Uh, he, he did it, of course, better and he reinvented it and ported it to 2014, so to say. But it was a real success and it was, uh, it was a good game. And after that game, we said, okay, now uh, one month after it, we said, okay, let's, let's go on Kickstarter then. Maybe the, the community is ready again. Um, and we said, okay, they got the offline game. Now they get an online game. Well, that fits. Let, let's, let's do it. And then there were three points which we didn't expect. The first thing was everyone thought we were Jordan Weissman. We were the same game like, uh, which were released on Kickstarter two months ago. So there was a lot of confusion about why are you, doing, why are you raising money for the same game twice? So there was, a uh, um, there was a real clean up work in the community to do to actually say, okay, we're a different company. The second thing was, um, after we did the cleanup work, they thought, okay, we are just like greedy developers who want to, to use the Shadowrun name and uh, raise money again because, oh, we saw the other game just raised one, over a million, like nearly two millions, so we can do that too. And so we had, again, to convince them uh, really hard to actually that we are passionate about this game and that's not just for, for grabbing easy money. And the third point, which is actually where we really missed that one, but it's obvious now. Um, we actually wanted to do a free-to-play game, and that was a big mistake, because uh, at that time we thought, okay, uh, if you have this, this pen and paper group and one plays Shadow and Chronicles, it should be easy for the other group to join in. And so we didn't want them to pay actually for the game. Um, we just said, okay, install the game and play with your friends. But doing a free-to-play game on Kickstarter, it's not how Kickstarter works because they really expect something in return. And in, in the mindset, if they're like paying for a free-to-play game, well, that just doesn't work out, especially if they already think that we're the greedy developers just uh, hunting for the money, and they say, yeah, free-to-play, well, they're the devil. And uh, so we had a lot more work to do, and in the end, we, 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 we kicked the free-to-play version and just said, okay, we're doing the pay-to-play thing. Well, that was our journey in Kickstarter. <laughs> but let's, let's um, go for the, for the do's and don'ts. Um, uh, there are actually a lot of points because um, I can't remember them uh, all uh, from my mind. Um, the first do you should is if you add reward tiers, you can't edit them anymore. Um, that's like a trivial point, right? Um, okay, yeah, then I, I make sure that I get it right. But the problem is you can easily, well, mistype and say save and someone backs it and well suddenly it's live and if you like have a tier which is like $15 for a t-shirt and suddenly it's only $5 for the t-shirt it could be easily that for every backer you get you make a lot of uh, well you, you actually you lose money for each backer so this can really uh, can be a pain in the ass. Um, make sure that your rewards are technically feasible. Uh, also, and probably obvious point, I mean, if you promise something in Kickstarter, it should be technically doable, right? You, you have talked to your programmers in, in beforehand. But in, in our case, it was really a really turbulent time at Kickstarter. Um, it, were, uh, it was really chaotic because um, we didn't expect that Kickstarter is that much work because actually um, at that time there was no like how to do Kickstarter on Google because we were the first. So we really had to find out for ourselves. And at that point, we were all stressed. And so inf information got uh, misunderstood. And suddenly, we promised something which actually took a lot more work. So try to um, well, keep away from that. Make sure that all reward promises agreements are phrased clearly without misinterpretation. Again, um, we had a support team who got really crazy when we said, OK, for $15, you can get a Shadowrun t-shirt. 
And suddenly the community asked, OK, which color, how long, in which sizes, uh, has, has it a logo on it, on the back maybe? And um, these were uh, like hundreds, thousands of emails coming into our support team just wanting to know how this shirt looks like. So the best thing to, to um, well, relieve your support team is simply every, every uh, reward you do, um, make a visual rep representation of it, and suddenly uh, only 10% of the mails will come in. Um, take care that you don't promise physical rewards. That, that really, that really uh, caught, it, caught us. We, we actually lost some money, I think, to that. Um, it's like, if you, prom if you promise a t-shirt for $15, um, if you like, make thousands of t-shirts, the cost of one t-shirt will probably be $3, maybe. Doesn't matter. But if you don't have to ship these things, and shipping one t-shirt can cost up to $20, so actually, you lose $20 for every backer backing uh, the $15 t-shirt thing, which is crazy. Um, so if you have rewards, try to do it digitally, because then you really can get rid of the shipping costs. Um, stick to your Kickstarter plan as much as pos possible, also a very obvious point. But in the heat of the moment, it's very easy to, to just react to the community, because the community suddenly sees, OK, they, they get it when, they, when the community is on Kickstarter, they, have their, they, they started to generate their own dream of the game, which, how it would look like. And then they tell you about it. And uh, when, if more people than one tell you about a certain thing on Kickstarter that they wanted, um, you, you really, it's, it's, it's very easy to say, OK, OK, we do that too. Or, or instead of that, we, we do that. And every time we did that, a lot of the other, like, especially if we changed features, um, the other community will react very negatively to it. And if you just promise more, well, you have to do more, which is also sometimes out of scope. So try to stick to your Kickstarter plan as much as possible and don't get irritated by the community too much. Of course, you have to listen to them, but uh, do it with, uh, like, rethink every decision you do. Make sure to document any special agreements immediately. Um, that we had one guy who used three months of his life after Kickstarter, just to document special agreements, just to send out surveys and gather data from the Kickstarter, uh, from the Kickstarter guys, so we can send out everything properly. Um, we had like 9,000 backers, and we had some special agreements. Uh, it will get lost immediately, and then you get a lot of, I had to do a lot of emails um, getting it right. So, um, well, it's also an obvious point, but, well, I can really urge you to do it. Um, let's, let's go to the, to the don'ts. Um, as I said, special agreements, uh, there are a lot of works so that probably don't do it, but what you shouldn't do at all are general special agreements, like simply add $15 to any backer tier if you want a t-shirt. So, because you actually have then to, to um, think why you, you get like 30 bucks. Uh, and he has, has test, uh, that tier. If you have two special agreements, like add $15 for a t-shirt or add $15 for a uh, mini figure, figure chair, then you have to find out what did he actually want. Did he want a t-shirt? Did he want a figure chair? And so it's even more work to, to do afterwards to um, get every special agreement right. And don't add rewards while the campaign is running, especially if the, if the campaign is at the end, because um, other people probably want that reward too. And so you have, after the campaign, a lot of, of uh, work to do to actually enable the players to, to get this other tier because uh, you're, you're such a nice person, right? Um, and last thing is, um, don't make strange tiers. Like, OK, I can, for 15 bucks, you can get the t-shirt or you can get a hoodie. It's also, it's, it's very um, confusing, not only for you in the after work, but it's also very confusing for, for um, the players, and the, the, your support crew will get a lot more emails based on, on, on this kind of stuff. So I, I hope that helped you a bit. Um, if, you, if you want to do a Kickstarter page, I really urge you to, to just Google them and then think of this while you do the Kickstarter campaign. Um, so after we did the Kickstarter, we, we actually succeeded in the Kickstarter. We raised uh, 550,000, um, despite all odds. And we said, OK, cool. Um, we have a community who actually act actively supports us because we obviously nailed the wishes, so it, or it seems so. So let's let's get out as fast as possible. Um, let them let them see what we're working on because we were really proud of what we did, and we said, okay, let's let's do early access. So every prototype we have, um, we put it immediately out the, immediately out there and um, show the world. And 
we did this and we saw, okay, there are a lot of benefits with doing that and there are some risks. So um, let's, let's talk about the benefits first. Um, the benefits of early access, I mean, there are some obvious points again, um, helps you slowly building up your core community. That's the most important point to go on early access, I think, because um, if you have like this core community who really is uh, with you in the first place and you, you, you feed them, you, you give them choices you, to, to like, do you want feature A or feature B? How would you like uh, this feature in a game? And if you get them involved into your game and make them really care about it, then it's not only like your game, it's also their game. And then you start defending this game. And this really helps, especially when you launch the game, because trolls will start coming into your forum, and they will, will try to, to really lurk developers out so they get response directly from developers. And the community, uh, we, we call it the community defense force. Um, th this community defense force can then take care of the trolls, and you don't have to reply it themselves. So the troll will come into your forum, and he will blah, 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 and the community says, no, that's not right, and you, you, you're a fucking troll. Go out, uh, play somewhere else. And a troll will say, oh, shit, I, I was not able to lure a dev developer out of hiding, um, so I don't get the attention I want. And the community is really for the developer, so hmm, let's, let's get to another forum and maybe try it there. Maybe I get my attention uh, easier uh, at another forum. And so this, this helps a lot um, you, because, well, you save a lot of time um, for um, defending trolls. The early revenue is also a, a big plus. I mean, we, without this revenue, we probably have to, as a, we, I think three months at least, we, we would have, um, have to finish uh, before we actually finish. I mean, we weren't finished, who, who is? Um, but with the early revenue, you can really keep going longer, which is quite nice. And benefits also, you get feedback from your most hardcore fans. Um, we interacted a lot with the community beforehand, but also as, as soon as the concept of the game is, is really in, 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 in near reach, uh, community will also think of new things and really, really can really help you improve the game. So interact with the community a lot because uh, they can really save you from, uh, from bad decisions. Um, on the risk side, on the other hand, is if you um, could you go to the next slide? Um, if you go, if you have this feedback from these most hardcore fans, um, you also have to have in mind that 90% of the feedback comes from 10% of the players. So if these most hardcore fans like tell you that oh, this, without this feature, this Shadowrun game will never make it, well, probably 90% of the other players would have liked this feature, and you only made a game like for 10% of all players. So every Every feedback you get from your form, you actually have to well compare with your vision and actually really think of it if, if it's uh, a good idea to do it and if you're really making a game for a, a subgroup of users because it's easy to do because if you do a fe uh, if you do like a feature for the ten percent of players, you get immediate a lot of positive feedback and it feels good it feels really good if you if you please your community and all say yeah that's exactly what we wanted but in the end on, on lunch day maybe it is a bad decision, even though you were, uh, even you get a lot of positive feedback while in early access. Um, the next point is actually a bummer. Um, if you do, we did every prototype we, we did for, for Shadowrun, we put in the first, we put it up on Steam early access. And people were like, what? That's the, that's the final game? And we said, no, no, well, that's, that's a prototype. We were just three months in development. You can't get a final game. And they said, well, that's the final game? And they said, no. And they didn't get it, actually. The, it was like, the, the re, the, it was like the, the dream of Kickstarter was destroyed by us because we just put a deck attack demo uh, onto Steam Early Access. And so what we did then was um, we, every time we, did, we, 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 well, we uploaded a build to Early Access, we made it really polished. We, made, we tried to, to make it as much fun as possible but in a small um, like a level demo of three levels. So the community does not, uh, I, well, at least sees that it's not um, how the game will really progress over time. And one important thing for that point is do a big splash screen in front of the game which actually says, okay, this is not a final game because otherwise, without the splash screen, People, especially this, is, this, uh, this will really uh, um, um, well, affect your Steam reviews negatively. People will just write reviews like, this game is not finished, negative review. 
and you say, of course, it's not finished. It's early access. So you can get a lot of these this, this negative reviews. Can, you can prevent them with the splash screen. This is not a final game. It's only a demo. And your, Steam, your, your review score will um, thank you for that. Um, media from early access will stick around. I actually underestimated this one as well. Um, if you do early access and you, for Arena Clash of Champions, for example, we had a lot of YouTubers on, and Let's Players in the community already in early access, and they put up tons of videos, and we got really good media coverage in early access. But as soon as we pressed the launch button and people started to Google our game, um, they've just found the early access videos, but they, pro they, were, they were like a, a year old sometimes. So um, people just looked at the game and said, well, that's the final game. We said, no, it's not the final game. Yeah, but there's a YouTube video, and it says, well, this is the game. So um, you actually have to, if you, if you press the launch button, try one, one month in advance to get new press into the, into the game, new Let's Players, uh, try to push the videos, make a new gameplay trailer for yourself, try to push it as well, so that when uh, on launch day someone searches on YouTube for your game, that, the, that he gets the new meteor and not the early access meteor. Um, well, and well, in the summary, I think the important part is just to interact with your community a lot, and uh, it's the, the main thing to actually get to know them, and they actually get to know you, and so you can invest in each other and um, make their and make make your game also their game. Um, as I said, Kickstarter has, has a lot of small pitfalls. Um, use Google. Try to find out what the big, uh, big ones are, and maybe remember my small ones. And as I said, early access is not all honey and milk. Early access is great, but if you do it, think of the negative points and try to address them beforehand, and uh, decide if early access is uh, worth your time. And well, I think it, this was actually the end. So if you have any questions, um, well, that would be the time now. So if you have questions, just raise your hand, and I will give you the mic. Did you have to work uh, to get a license or any sort of licensing uh, with the original creator? And then did he have any say in how you did things? That's, that's actually the, the funniest story of all. Um, we had the Shadowrun license was uh, created by Jordan Weisman. Then it went to Microsoft, and then Jordan Weisman bought it back from Microsoft to do Shadow Returns, which was the other Kickstarter. Um, we didn't know that. We actually negotiated with Jordan Weisman to get the license. Then he negotiated back and said, hey, guys, I, I want the single player license back. Can we trade somehow? And we said, OK, we, let's, let's do the online games. It's actually a better choice. And he said, hey, cool, thanks. Let's, let's trade licenses. So he got the offline part. We got the online part again. And we were like very naive, and we thought, OK, he just maybe he wants to develop a game in, in in some years or so, but no, he actually prepared it. So he just it was actually I think not month or two months before we did the Kickstarter. So we negotiated with him, and he said, "I offline, you online." Do you think uh, that this Kickstarter campaign would work um, now, like a few years after? Not at all. We, we made so many mistakes. And uh, if we done like the Kickstarter with equality, we did at that time, it would not succeed uh, again. I think if we learned from the mistakes and we actually if, um, adapted the Kickstarter to the, how today's Kickstarters are made, um, it probably would succeed. Especially also um, we, had, uh, we have more time between um, the other Shadowrun game and yes. And do you consider, um, because you said you're going to be working now on a new project? Yes. So, and do you consider Kickstarter as an option? Um, we're not at the stage yet. We are currently just um, in the reforming process. Um, and I think at the first it will be a lot of work for hire, just to get the money in. And if we do our own game, yes, Kickstarter is, of course, an option. Um, but this time, well, we um, probably won't do um, an online game anymore. And, and do the indie early access kicks out the way. Yeah, any other questions? Okay, so thanks again, Michael, okay, for thank the you presentation. Again.